is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, June 28, 2013. Uh, joining me this week, we've got Sandy Springman from the Arecibo Observatory. Although, where is your fancy radio telescope background? I'm sorry, I brought you a fancy jungle background instead. That's, that's pretty special. Oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> Better than a wall. <laughs> Better than a wall. No, it's great. You can just like sit outside in the jungle and, and report on space news. <laughs> something meta going on here. <laughs> um, Amy Shear Title from Vintage Space. Hello. And thank you very much last week for handling the Weekly Space Hangout. Me. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here to do it this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did, did, this is almost well. a repeat. It's yeah, almost a repeat. A little, little smoother. <laughs> yeah, is it a little smoother? <laughs> yeah. Well, I've probably done 200 of these, so you, yes. know, you just have another 199 to catch up. But it's good. It's good. Well, we knew you it. could... We knew you would handle it with grace and a little rage, and that's what we were hoping for. So there was no rage. No was rage. She was, rage. A, she was a consummate professional. professionalism. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. Um, and David Dickinson, aka hey. Astro Guys, writer here. for Universe Today and other places. All right, and this is our team. So uh, now it's going to be a little funny over the summer. Um, Nicole is, I don't know, listening to the radio or something, telescopes, you know, with her headset everyone's out. On yeah, everyone's on vacations. It's, it's going to be kind of crazy over the summer. I know Pamela's pretty busy. I know I'm going to be pretty busy, so it's going to be kind of weird over the summer. So it's I They're apologize not. in advance. Things might get a little weird. So this week, uh, we're we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about what is up with all the smashed moons. <laughs> um, uh, the fact that Voyager has is almost promised now, very soon, leaving the solar system. Maybe uh, the planets run Gliza, Gliza six six seven C. The return of Shenzhou ten. Uh, the PayPal space currency. Uh, how people can help search for lunar impacts on the moon, that 10,000 near-Earth objects have been discovered, and that's not many, unfortunately. Yay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Now, you can interact with us. This is all interactive. You can make any comments or questions. There's a bunch of places you can do it. First, you can make a comment over on the event page if you're watching this on Google+. You can make a comment on YouTube. You can make a comment on... Uh, if you're watching this just in my stream, you can make a comment there. Uh, and you can also make a comment on Twitter, although, strangely, the thing that lets me track comments on Twitter isn't working in the Hangout toolbox, so... Yeah, I'm not able to hashtag either. Yeah, I don't know why I'm not able to sort of follow the hashtag. I just can use keep YouTube. an eye on it. Just, just use YouTube. That's, that's all i got to say now. Like I, it's, I have nothing but Google Plus open right now, so like, if I open Twitter, I'll freeze. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so just, yeah, no, not you, David. Don't, please don't have any extra <laughs> processes running. Um, yep. But yeah, I, I highly recommend that you go over and, and just make your comments on YouTube. Uh, and while you're on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe, wherever that subscribe is. <laughs> that way you'll get uh, notifications when this happens next time. All right, so first, so this is funny. So uh, I don't know what it was. Was it, was it Sandy? Who, someone, just, just before we were getting ready, someone said, what's with all the smashed we, moons? David, we, I think. We were, we, yeah, we were talking about, and I had written about Oblivion. I had seen Oblivion at the beginning of the summer blockbuster season. That was the first sighting I had, and that was kind of part of the plot where the Earth's moon had been destroyed. Now, when I went to see Star Trek Into Darkness... I noticed that Kronos had kind of the same thing going on, the Klingon homeworld moon. It what did you see when they in... showed it? But it had a smashed moon orbiting as well. Now, when I saw Man of Steel two weeks ago, I noticed Krypton had a smashed moon uh, when they showed the whole sky vista. So that seems to be a sci-fi trope that's going around this summer. That's three official smashed moon sightings out there. Uh, I, I know in, in the Superman mythos, there is some precedent for that because it was one of the... Uh, Kryptonian supervillains, not to geek out too much on DC comic history or anything like that. One of the DC, one of the Kryptonian supervillains that had smashed that moon before. So, but it seems now that if you have a sci-fi movie, you have to have a smashed moon on the horizon there. Well, <laughs> to... You know, I've been watching so many science fiction movies, and I've been waiting for someone to finally present the science correctly. Yeah, and I feel like yeah. finally we're getting what we need from the from the movie makers that we you know that you've got this moon and it's smashed up and there's chunks of debris yeah. and it's just now, floating next to each other in space that, just the way it would happen in in the real universe, right? That would, that would be 
Well, yeah. I mean, if you looked at the uh, Krypton's moon, or in Star Trek, the moon getting smashed up, it just sort of looked like it was it was kind of just in process. There. It was just kind of hanging there, yes. you know, like, a, like a Christmas ornament or something. And I don't know, I was watching it with both of my bosses and a number of co-workers, and we came out of the movie theater, and we were all like, what was with that smashed up moon on Cronus? That's not how <laughs> things should happen. <laughs> it's funny that many people notice that. Okay, so please. Uh, my wife got it too. Somebody set the science straight. If you had a smashed up moon, what would it look like? Yeah, it, it, it depends how long it had been smashed how, up. Let's, let's, I mean, because it, it probably... You know. If it got hit with something, a, a big collider, it, it might never re-coalesce, but if it's kind of just fragments like they showed in Oblivion, it, probably in a year or two, I think, it would re-aggregate back into a moon again. You might end up with a ring around the Earth, which would be kind of cool. Yeah. Right, you're gonna get you're gonna get a a situation where the thing is, as you said, you know, if it's if it's not very big, if it's I don't know if they've shot it with some super duper mining laser and it's kind of torn apart, it's just gonna. I mean, in, the gravity is just gonna pull it right back together in, again. I I was thinking in Oblivion, if we're dealing with an alien invasion force that can destroy our moon, we're kind of like it's not even gonna be any kind of competition. Right. <laughs> so I mean, a good example of you know a moon that is going to be destroyed is Phobos, which is around which is around Mars, yes. and Phobos is is rotating within the Roche limit of yes. of it. And so the trick is this sort of magical spot. So if you get like the, the the Mars is turning and Phobos is going around Mars, and if you get the situation where uh, Phobos is going faster than Mars rotates, then it's actually starting to spiral inward towards Mars. And at some point within the, about the next 10 million years or so, the tidal forces on Phobos are going to tear it apart and it's going to sort of turn into this ring of debris orbiting Mars, and then that ring of debris is going to just kind of come down and and lay these Ph awesome Phobos, crater chains. Yeah, Phobos makes is the closest moon orbiting to its primary in the solar system, and it actually rises in the west from the from as an observer on the Martian surface, it rises in the west and sets in the east because, like you're saying, it actually is going around faster than the planet is rotating. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty amazing to sort of imagine that we we exist in this moment in time that uh, that we just happen to have this this moon. Is, are you getting like some kind of thunderstorm in the background, Sandy? That's awesome. Well, yes, I am. <laughs> um, so I'm here. Yeah. So you can imagine, you know, in the it's, jungle. it's amazing when you think about amazing coincidences, right? We have the coincidence that the moon and the sun are the same size in the sky for us, and in this and, epoch. Yeah, no, which is coincidence, right? Yeah, and yeah. we have the coincidence that we happen to see Phobos, because in just just a little over a billion years, the moon is receding from us, and in a little over a billion years, we won't have total solar eclipses anymore. Yeah. We live in that that current epoch in time right now, where the moon can cover the sun about forty percent of the time. A lot of times, like this past eclipse was annular; it was too small, yeah. so we don't always get total solar eclipses anymore either right now. So, so any sci-fi writers now, movie scripters wanting to show a smashed hey, moon. Just... I'm available for consultation. <laughs> <laughs> just throw one out there. Don't. Just don't do it. Just, it looked you know too what? tidy. It looked too neat. <laughs> I think it would be a lot more of a mess. Yeah. Again, I'm, not, did the best. I'm not a dynamicist. I'm not a theorist. You'd have to ask my office mate, but he would, he would give you a more straight answer. Uh, if you could look into that, that would be great. Um, all right. <laughs> Moving on. So let's talk about... The big news has got to be the, the planets around. We all pronounce it. Now I've forgotten. I'm going to have this Gliese. lovely German... Gliese. Gliese. I'm gonna have this, Gliese. I had, this, I had this nice German lady tell me how to say it. Now I've lost it. Gliese. Gliese. You, you'd think with my last name I would be able to pronounce yeah. these sort of words. But nope. Uh, uh, so Amy, I know you reported on it, right? Uh, yeah, I did a little bit about it, and I sort of put it in, in the context of finding interesting planets around red dwarf stars, which is sort of um, not unheard of, but it's pretty rare. So um, the big discovery is that around this, and now I'm going to say it wrong, <laughs> um, there is a, a, um, a triple star system called, I, I guess actually, is the system called Giliza, because the, the three stars are Giliza, 6, 6, 7, A, B, and C. And around um, the star C, which is actually the smaller and dimmer of the three. Um, they found three 
I don't know who they are off the top of my head, um, some very clever people found three potentially, potentially habitable planets orbiting in that star's habitable zone. Um, so that's, that's pretty significant because you wouldn't expect a red dwarf necessarily to have a big habitable zone to actually hold three planets. And these three planets are taking up most of the star's habitable zone. Um, but that's that's pretty big and pretty cool. And you get to, you know, were you to go to one of these planets, you would see three suns setting in the sky. Uh, the main star would be big and the other two would look kind of like the moon, which, as we just discussed, are the same size in our sky. <laughs> um, so that's coming off the heels, and this is what I, I think is kind of neat, is this is coming off the heels of um, the red dwarf star uh, T.W. Hydrae, around which astronomers found a gap in its protoplanetary disk that suggests there's another planet forming really far from this star. Again, another red dwarf star, which is it's kind, of, kind of interesting because they're not the typical stars that you see not only forming planets, but in the case of Giliza, forming habitable planets. So we still haven't quite found the uh, the Holy Grail yet. We haven't got no. the Earth-sized world in a habitable zone. No, these these two these two planets, um, or these three planets rather, are bigger than um, they're bigger than the Earth. I'm not sure how much bigger, but oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, bigger. Sorry, phone. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and that's what we're and that's what we're. So expecting. they're they're. Significantly bigger than the Earth, there's um, mul you know two or three times the the mass of the size of the Earth. Um, so we're we're still far from getting that perfect planet, but this is a step closer. And every time we find something like this, some really interesting pl looking planet in a habitable zone around a star that you wouldn't expect to find it around, it sort of broadens the scope of where we can be looking for exoplanets. And that's what's really neat about this is that this is kind of changing the way we look for exoplanets. So as we keep digging through Kepler's data, because the mission is not dead yet, um, and you know, whatever comes next, there's just going to be more places to look for this twin Earth, or evil Earth twin, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's kind of bittersweet when you think about the loss of Kepler at the same time, right? I mean, we've lost the, the planet hunting machine that was turning up a lot of these, a lot of these planets. Yeah, but there's still, I mean, they, in the press conference, I guess it was like two months ago now or something, um, they did say that they have terabytes worth of data still to go through, and that's significant. Still I mean, they've, through, yeah. it's, it's not like, I, I read this somewhere because I like the idea of Kepler being a pirate, um, of just pointing and saying, planet, oh, that's not what happens, right? It takes this light data and looks at the interference patterns, and it, you know, astronomers are the ones looking through the data to find things. So there's still tons of stuff to do until we get another telescope up there. And there's also Hubble. Um, so I'm not, I wouldn't call it like, I mean, it's sad, but we're still doing stuff with it, which is kind of neat. No, it's all sad. <laughs> all sad all the way down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well... You, you have know, the saddest worldview. Yeah. Well, no, I mean... <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I am really a big fan of of solving the most interesting scientific question that we could possibly ask, which is, is there life in the universe? So, you know, this yeah. is one step along that along that path. And so if we yeah. lose Kepler, and now, you know, I mean, the other piece of news this week was that they're shutting down the Corot telescope. You know, they've lost that. So now, so that's the other planet hunting telescope. Te so now two Te planet hunting telescopes are down. Te TESS is the next one in the pipeline, and that's not till 2017, I believe. Right, be the next exo. That's yeah. going to be the Kepler successor. So yeah, so I mean, it's great that there is a you know that there is a successor in the you know in the pipeline, and there should be more of these, and that's great. It is you know because the big problem with with Kepler and with these kinds of planet hunting, you know, to find an Earth-sized world in the habitable zone around a sun-like star, you need a you need to wait a year for it to make a transit in front of the the planet in front of the star and that's your first one so you don't know how long that one took and then you have to wait another year and then you get another one well maybe you've seen it but maybe you haven't so you gotta wait a third year to really confirm <laughs> your data ideally four years or five years and you know and that push and now Kepler is not going to be able to, to provide oh, there, that level of data there's, right? um, there's ARCID too if it gets its two million yeah yeah Sonny you've been yeah you've been, they're gonna hunt, yeah, they're you've been hunt, tracking but... ARCID how is, how is yeah. ARCID doing? Yeah, the cat just ran <laughs> The cat, the cat just ran off with my headphones. Good. <laughs> cat got your. Cat I, just, got your I just gave Arkid my 
I, I just gave Arkin my 25 shekels there an hour or two ago. So. Yeah, 25 I've, shekels divided by four. That's what? <laughs> I paid. <laughs> I don't know what the paid. exchange rate is these days. I bought, I bought, I paid my 25. I want my selfie. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to my uh, selfies in space in a, in a while. So they're, they're hoping for a stretch goal of yeah. 1.7 million. Um, they're at one, one and a quarter million right now, which is pretty exciting. So there have been a lot of, uh, they've um, made a lot of their stretch goals, uh, including number of donors, but they're also hoping to do an asteroid zoo project. So if they get 1.7 million, they'll create a new project on Zooniverse for people to find potentially hazardous asteroids from Catalina Sky Survey data. I've always wanted to discover an asteroid. Oh, cool. I, I really, I would yeah. really love to have an asteroid. You can't name it if you discover it, but you can name it after someone else. And I think that would be tons of fun. You can't, if you discover an asteroid, you can't name it after yourself? No, and you can't name it after a pet either. Uh, someone named his, an asteroid that he discovered, Mr. Spock, <laughs> after his cat, who is inquisitive and had pointy ears. The IAU did not like that. So you cannot name asteroids know? after pets anymore. They because that's know. what I said in the citation. Spock. They oh. know. They well, find. They figured out. The IAU knows everything. <laughs> yeah. So here, I don't know if this is coming through. So you can see the different stretch goals yeah. they've got. So they've they've passed the one million. Um, the next to ground station of the one point three million. A beta selfie of the one point five million, and then partnering up with Asteroid Zoo at one point seven million. Yeah, and then so, fifty thousand yeah. less than fifty thousand more dollars. They'll have an extra ground station, so it'll be easier to download oh, data cool. faster. And that closes uh, this Sunday. And that's that's in fifty four. It closes in fifty four hours, so June thirtieth. Yep. So if this is going to sort of go the way we've seen them before, that's probably the number they're going to get is the one point three. It's going to be hard just to wrap that up in fifty seven. Fifty seven. Yeah, hours I mean to they've been they've more. been pretty persistent. They've been doing hangouts. Yep. They did a. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They did a Ask Me Anything on Reddit with yep. all of their engineers. So people were asking them questions, and they talked about. Oh, what's that? Um, uh, this, that app, the, the something orbit. They said their engineers learned everything they knew about orbit mechanics from this the space command app. Oh, uh, the eyes on the solar system one. No, it starts with a K. It's a, it's a game. Oh, anyway. Kerbal Space Program. Yes, yes. They said yes. one of their engineers learned everything he knows about orbit old mechanics from the Kerbal Space Program. I've I've heard that's a fun game. I got to give that a try at some point. Get the kids into it. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, you know, I mean. If you're watching this right now and you've got some extra money and you want to pitch in, then by all means, you know, I, I will destroy my journalistic integrity and go help donate to get the space telescope built and, and extra ground stations and, you know, participating in extrasolar planet research. That would be fantastic. Um, I don't, yeah, if they get to 2 million, that would be pretty cool. I doubt they're going to get to 2 million by Sunday, but you never know with these things. So, I'm surprised that they, that they didn't make more money than they did. Actually, I mean, they did a really great job of promoting it. You know, if they had sort of put me in charge of promoting it, I, I don't <laughs> we wrote think a lot of articles about them. We did. Well, no, I know. I mean, they definitely sort of somehow co-opted me into helping them promote it. But, <laughs> but I think you know, if I can't imagine, I wouldn't have been able to promote this any better. You know, they did a fantastic job. They did tons of reaching out, tons of outreach, lots of video, lots of updates. It was all really great. And and I'm. Uh, you know. Once it gets out into space, who knows how it might be used? I mean, they, they once it's there and in space, they they may use it for exoplanet hunting anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, is the real. I mean, the real mission is four million dollars, right? And this is just the beginning. There's going to be multiple yeah. telescopes going up. I think you know everyone's just waiting to see if they can actually get this thing in space for the price that they're saying. And then you know you can imagine lots of research institutions and and uh, universities that have various projects buying time on these telescopes at a fraction of the price that they might have to pay if they're going to go through Kepler or something something like that. So you can imagine, you know, if they can actually do this and sustain it, then you're going to start to see, I think, hopefully this will make a lot more research at a lot more reasonable price. In in Canada, we've got the the, the most telescope. Most, yes. Most, yeah. At most and most, yep. Yeah, and they call it the Humble Space Telescope because the thing cost $8 million <laughs> to launch, and it's a... You know, I have come across it. Yeah, um, a friend of mine, Jamie Matthews, out of Vancouver, sort of runs the runs the program, and uh, it's you know, it's a reasonable price. It does a very specific job, but it you know, it's 
and it was it was eight million dollars, and it's you know I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as as capable as as what these are. So I think this is a great time. I think I think Arc- this Arc- is good. yeah, Arc- it will be a SpaceX uh, Falcon two launch too. Falcon yeah, well you know we, the two really go together. You know peanut butter and jam. So. <laughs> um, okay, well, and speaking of the need to discover things in space, Sandy, uh, we have discovered, you have discovered 10,000 near-Earth asteroids. Well, yeah. we, uh, the greater asteroid community has discovered over 10,000 near-Earth asteroids. We don't discover them. We, we follow up with radar. We are, we are absolutely not a discovery tool at Arecibo Observatory. But uh, U.S. resources have discovered over 98% of near-Earth asteroids, which is kind of exciting. We're at 10,000 these days, and a lot of them have been discovered by robotic surveys. Catalina Sky Survey, Linear, based in New Mexico, and then this uh, Project Panstar is coming online in Hawaii. So this is really exciting. 10,000, that's an awful lot of... Oh, you've lost your audio there. there (laughs) There's about 300,000 asteroids overall that have been discovered so far, which is a lot, and we're expecting that there's another... 90,000 near-Earth objects out there waiting to be discovered. So what size are we talking about here? Sorry? How big are these asteroids? I mean, they're, you know, anything from, the t- you know, meters to tens of kilometers. This morning we were looking at something, something the size of a dinosaur killer, nine kilometers across. So you get, you get really, you know, quite the variety of, of size of these near-Earth objects. So, yeah, one that's, you know, five meters across, it's not going to ruin your day. NASA can probably bring it home on a leash. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll you're a good ex- asteroid. You're a good asteroid. Yeah, it'll but explode the above ones, the uh, the atmosphere in uh, in Russia, maybe, or or wherever. Yeah, you know, people are like, hey, that, why? That, you know, people that will one not came out of the sun. Why don't they, you know, blow up over DC? It's like, well, that's where our funding comes from. In case you didn't <laughs> notice. Yeah. So you know, these larger ones would really, you know, ca- cause global devastation. You know, smaller ones, a couple kilometers across. If you have a one-kilometer asteroid that hits the Earth, it's going to create a ten-kilometer crater. And gosh, you know, it's going to ch- uh, turn up a lot of stuff into the atmosphere. It's going, you know, can cause earthquakes, type, uh, tsunamis, all sorts of unpleasantries. So really, it's it's important to find these things before they find us. So there's this gra- uh, this asteroid grand challenge coming online, and the European Space Agency has a new NEO coordination center, spelled the European way. So people are there's more money going into surveys, and NASA's really hoping to find most of the dangerous near Earth objects by 2020. So so by 2020, we could we could pretty much know where every single dangerous asteroid in the entire solar system is like the you know the near earth near earth objects and have sort of worked out the um the torino scale for all of them right yeah so the torino scale is an idea of uh how um hazardous an object would be if it uh it hit the earth based on its size and then also the um the frequency of impact of an object of that size so you have things the size of Tunguska every, you know, so many years. You have dinosaur killers every in the tens of million years, and then the little five-meter ones all the time coming through the atmosphere. So that's what the Torino scale is. And, uh, right, and so we could say, well, you know what, we don't even need to do any kind of asteroid program because we're safe for the next 300 years. Or, uh-oh, we've got these very risky objects and we're going to need to get on them. I think I see a lot of people don't always understand is that the predictions get less uncertain the more the further you go out in time uh, as far as, you know, things disturb things in their orbit. So that all these predictions are kind of, you know, they're, they're more accurate the closer in that we see something coming by. Yeah, right now, you know, we're pretty confident the next couple of decades we're, we're okay. Yeah. But once you get into the 2030s, 2050s, there are some objects that might, might come, you know, be it, <laughs> ruin your day. And, you know, anything bigger than 500 feet, that's enough to level a city. That would be a five-kilometer crater. That's not a good day. <laughs> no, that would really stink. I mean, and 500 feet, if you've seen photos of Arecibo Observatory, that's about the distance from the platform to the bottom of the dish, which, you know... <laughs> that's big. Gosh, that's, that's, that's big, but that's also kind of small. <laughs> Kinetic right. energy is, is just sort of harsh. It... it <laughs> Yeah, and I know there's lots of proposals to to put together space-based telescopes that will actually, you know, contribute to this discovery as well. So I think like Arcid, like Arcid, right? And, and yeah, other ones. I know NASA has 
from, from various times put put ideas in in circulation for doing that as well. So, you and know, that's what this asteroid grand challenge is about: better ways to find things, deflection techniques, um, sort of. Have you looked into? Did you guys talk about the grand challenge last week? I didn't. We did. We did talk about that. Okay. A bit. All right. Okay. I didn't want to bring that topic up again. I figured you guys would have talked about that. So, <laughs> um, okay, cool. All right. So, uh, I'm Amy. Do you want to talk about Voyager leaving the solar system again? Maybe, probably. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> for 2013. <Possibly. laughs> um, this year's possibly for I'll start for Voyager leaving the uh, solar system. So yeah, Voyager might be leaving the solar system again. So sort of like the old news that keeps being new news because it is really cool. Um, so, so Voyager was launched in September of 1977 and it, um, it whipped by Jupiter and then Saturn and Saturn's gravity sort of popped it up in out of the plane where all the planets orbit. So it just kind of started heading towards interplanetary space and it's been going for 33 years since that happened? Yes, I can math. Uh, 33 years since it left Saturn in December of 1980. Um, and it's getting into this really kind of murky region towards the edge of the solar system, and there's kind of this uh, boundary uh, called the, the heliosphere that is created by the charged particles of solar wind. So once, once it leaves those charged particles and gets into cosmic ray particles that generally can't get past that barrier, um, that will be when it's in interplanetary space. However, it's very hard to figure out what when that's going to happen, or even figure out when it happens, because the it's in this, this space right now, um, called the magnetic highway, where um, charged particles from the solar wind and charged particles from cosmic rays are passing past each other, but they're lined up in uh, along the magnetic field of the sun. So Voyager is sampling some interplanetary space stuff, but it's not there yet because it's still sampling enough uh, solar system wind stuff. So it's getting closer, um, and that's pretty cool, but it's it's not quite there yet. So what astronomers or, or the mission team is looking for, there's kind of um like there's going to be, they, they think, there's going to be a very abrupt change in the direction of the magnetic field that Voyager is experiencing and registering, and that would indicate the presence of proper interstellar magnetic field that is out of the solar system and we have finally 36 years later or however long it is at that point <laughs> reached interplanetary space. Um, so it might be you know months or years or it could be tomorrow but I don't know it's kind of like it's still a 36 year old spacecraft that's 11 billion miles away right now, and it's still talking to the Earth, and that is so cool. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that's great about this is that it's mm -hmm. running the um, it's running this this RTG nuclear. Yes. I mean, it's not really a nuclear yeah. plant, but it's running this this plutonium. thermal, yeah, plutonium thermal reactor. Not really a reactor. Anyway, um, but the point is that it's showing you how long these things last, and this is what's inside Curiosity, and this yeah. is what's inside New Horizons. So we've got, you know, I think. A lot of years ahead for these for these spacecraft, and I'm really yeah. glad they're 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 starting to build a program again to to put these into future spacecraft. So because I think I think the last I saw, and I'm if if I'm wrong on this, they correct me, someone. But I think Voyager has enough power in its RTG to power it through at least 2020. At which point they're going to have right. to start shutting down. Um, they they have I mean some instruments have failed and they have had to shut shut some stuff down. But I think it. 2020, it's going to be the point where it starts to get a little bit critical to shut down some things to conserve what remaining power there is. So that that's going to be a very long-lasting RTG. So oh. if you know, if off, the top of my, off the top of my head, I think plutonium 238. What's in it is the half-life is 77 years. I'm pretty certain, just without looking it up on Wikipedia. Nice. That's a little piece of knowledge to know. Um, <laughs> unless that you're wrong. That, um, yeah, unless you're wrong. A, well, within a few years, I think 77, it may be yeah. 75, 78, for 238. That's not the weaponized stuff. The weaponized stuff is 239. It's a different isotope. Right. But it's like that means it will be at 50% power after 77 years of use. And you know, if any alien civilization finds that RTG, they could actually date when that plutonium was manufactured by looking at its half life. It would be an easy mathematical calculation for anybody that knows uh, anything that happened, would happen, they would know. <laughs> but I like wonder kind of if, cool. you know, I mean, it's like, what, 78,000 years of Voyager to get to the nearest star system and not even, like, it's pointed at the nearest star system? So, you no, know, you, you know, you could imagine 
you know, we're going to be having this conversation again in 200 years. Like, Voyager's just left the, <laughs> almost left the heliopause into intergalactic, but yeah. Um, so a couple of comments here. Uh, Hugo Burnham says, will the asteroids, this is back to the asteroid conversation, will the asteroids that are captured for mining be included? So, you know, you know, you know your, your asteroid on a leash, Sandy, will that be counted? Counted in the what, in the 10,000? In the, yeah, in the 10,000, in the, in the, in the, all of the ones that need to be counted, yeah. I think, I think those will be, well, th those will probably, those will be smaller than 500 feet, 140 meters. So they're not part of the ones that NASA is trying to find, they're not one of the city levelers, but they'll they'll yeah. be counted in the total near Earth object population. But those, are, the ones that NASA is going to bring home that are the size of a school bus or a, the swimming pool that we have at the observatory or the size of your car, I'm I'm really not worried. That's, that's a lot about. of new asteroids needing names. <laughs> well, linear right. ones, linear ones don't get names, which is really. Oh. I mean, there's some ast There's one program though that if you win the Intel Science Fair Challenge as a high school student, you can get an asteroid named after you. So I have a bunch of friends who have asteroids, which is infuriating because they've never done a lick of asteroid <laughs> research. And I've been, you know, I've been looking at rocks in space for over eight years now. I really want an asteroid. It's pretty great. I, I know, say. somebody somebody here does. I <laughs> yeah, I have an asteroid named after me. Okay. Um, <laughs> There was, uh, let's see, so Rob Kroll says, we found out more and more star systems a long time ago in a Isaac Asimov story, uh, and he wasn't sure what the name was. It was Naz Nadieszki Nosi. I'm sh uh, and Isaac saying, Asimov you know, wrote a lot of stories. Yeah, but that sounds like Nightfall. <laughs> that sounds like, I think the story he's talking about is Nightfall, Nightfall, right? Yeah, Nightfall yeah. is this is a great story. I like the, the short story better than the book part, but the, the gist is that this this is a star that's in sort of close to the galactic core, and so it's got tons of, or it's in a, in a globular star it's cluster. A globular. Yeah, and it's got tons and tons of stars in the sky, except for one night, you know, an astronomer has figured out that they're going to, you know, all be down at the same time or be in transit or, you know, get eclipsed, and there will be no there will be no stars in the sky for, or no suns for one night or for a few hours and predicts that everyone's going to go crazy because they don't know they, what it they means. Figure, yeah. they, they can't figure out why their civilization collapses every 20,000 years until they realize it's like, oh, because we only have night once every 20,000 years. <laughs> right, exactly. And, uh, yeah, I thought it was a, it's a great, uh, the short story was good because, I, I don't know, it's one of those things, you know, you get this just this great idea and then, you know, you don't need to necessarily uh, turn it into a book. So, um, okay, let's move on. Uh, the Return of Shenzhou 10, David. Yes, uh, the space population went down by three again later earlier this week when three Takonauts, or astronauts, depending on, on uh, how you want to phrase the terminology, returned to Earth Wednesday, uh, early Wednesday morning Chinese time, Central China time, 8.07, AM local. It was about midnight UTC, about eight o'clock Tuesday evening. Where and they actually showed the whole thing on CCTV when they returned. They were on a 15-day mission. This was the second mission to Tiangong One, and this is the last mission they're doing. Tiangong One was kind of a proof of concept thing that the Chinese did, uh, leading up to their new space station that they want to get up there, kind of like a mirror redux that they want to put up by 2020. It's going to be kind of a modular. They're going to launch a core and then they're going to have all these kind of mini Tiangong modules that are going to hook to it, kind of like a big Lego space station. They don't have a shuttle or anything to assemble it with. There, yes, there is the photo. <laughs> I love this if you, picture. <laughs> if you look closely in the back, and it was interesting when we watched the video play when they actually came down, the module actually was drug. You can see it there on oh, the grass. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it actually was drug quite a ways across. I had never seen that on a Soyuz landing there. I don't know what the difference is with their Shen, the Shenzhou modules, but they always seem to hit pretty hard when they land. They have the, I don't know if they have an issue with their retro rockets. I'm just kind of speculating or what, what it is, but it, 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 it hit, and then we actually saw that. It looked very War of the Worlds with it laying there on the, 
on the tundra just for a bit with that big drag mark behind it like it had come in hot or something like that. It was smoking and there was this big drag mark in behind it. But, but it's uh, not it was, like they like hooked up a tractor and, and moved it. It was like like maybe the parachutes were still open and, the, and the high I, wind or something and just pulled it along. I, the... think, I think it looked pretty windy that day. On, yeah. It was uh, on the inner Mongolia there in northern China where they landed and I think it, the parachute might have just drug away before it, it finally detached. But uh, it, they all they all got out fine, and it was it was interesting to watch the. I was surprised not many people were watching on on CCTV on the reentry, and because the, they they followed the whole thing in just like the Soyuz landing in it. And I was actually out watching for a pass of Sen, Shenzhou and Tiangong the morning before when they undocked. I didn't see the the Taikonauts, but I saw the Tiangong when it went by uh, that morning. We had some visual passes, so that was kind of cool to see. It's still up there. It's going to be up there until late. 2013, they're, they're, they haven't got a final date when they're going to deorbit, but they think they're definitely going to deorbit their space station pretty soon. So in the next couple of years, they're going to assume uh, assembling their new, uh, as of yet unnamed, space station. Look at that! Look at I like this picture here. They're just bringing their space chairs over so they can they yes. can sit down and you know. I don't know. It, it was just the way that whole thing was framed. It was quite something. And, and the one, the one uh, teacher that went up there, I forget her name. She actually gave an entire lesson. I watched it on CCTV. They broadcast it later on. on really? CMG. And uh, yeah, she kind of given Commander Hetfield some some competition. I thought there, so it was actually kind of a, a good little uh, space lesson lesson that they did that all the students in China followed along. And it was it was kind of interesting to watch. It's all up there. It's probably on YouTube archive now, but it was kind of interesting. That's really cool. Uh, Hugo Burnham asks, oh, noted that RTGs use two thirty eight plutonium, which decays with yes. a half life of eighty seven point seven years. That was um, a there you go. You're off by ten. Um, and <laughs> also, Hugo wanted to know, did they carry the deck doors, deck chairs into orbit with them? And no, clearly you could see these deck chairs were brought by, they were, by the they were brought uh, in yeah, when by the ground support. And it's all to, yeah, it's interesting with the Soyuz one too to watch how when they go up and do the opening and, and everything. It's it's really and we talked about I think this last week where all this stuff with the Chinese space programs and the Russian space programs a few decades ago being a child of the Cold War that all went on in secret. So it's really fascinating to me to be able to they have that access where we're getting to see how they operate and how they do things now and it's 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 pretty interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we've talked about that. We've talked about that. Uh, okay, so let's talk about PayPal's new service. And I will sort of read out a little bit here so we can get up to speed. So it's, um, it's called PayPal Galactic. And so this is PayPal's teaming up with Payments the Payments in space! In space, yeah. <laughs> Aren't um, they already going to space? You transfer money and it goes to a satellite and back down or something? And come on. <laughs> but if you are in space and you don't have any cash and you can't hit a bank machine, how will you pay? And this because is the movie problem. theaters in space only take cash. They only take cash, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so so they've, they've partnered up, PayPal's partnered up with uh, SETI Institute people uh, to come up with PayPal Galactic, which is just like PayPal, but for space payments. Now, that sounds crazy, but, um, you so know, it's important. Here's my uh, email address, so pay me maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, Right, so uh, so here's just a little quote here. So as space tourism programs are opening space travel to the rest of us, this drives questions about the commercialization of space. We are launching PayPal Galactic in conjunction with leaders in the scientific community to increase public awareness of the important questions that need to be addressed. Uh, we may not answer these questions today or even this year, but one thing is clear, we won't be using cash in space. PayPal has already pushed payments onto the internet, onto phones, and across terrestrial borders. We look forward to pushing payments from our world to the next and beyond. So, um, so now, if we find an ET signal, we can just paywall them and say, "If you want to hear more, click here." If you want to hear more, click here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This sounds like a kind of publicity experiment to me, but well, it's probably going to be great for the SETI Institute. Yeah, absolutely. So great, you know, great, great going for the folks at the SETI Institute. I just, you know, how long will it be? You know, just imagine all of the things that need to be figured out before this part gets done. You need to have, you know, you need to have, Living. I don't know, a way to launch people into space inexpensively. You need a place where people can go and survive and not die in space. You need a way to resupply them. You need some way to, you know, get up, 
get goods into space that they wish, wish to purchase. No, I understand. I understand. There is going to be capacity. There's going to be infrastructure. This is anticipating needs. This is yeah. I'm I'm it, space <laughs> elevator. In the, in the larger scale, I think, you know, I, I appreciate things like this. And I also think it's really cool that um, in Silicon Valley, there's not necessarily a lot of communication between the space sort of and the astronomy groups and startups and sort of more the technology, uh, internet-based companies. So I think this is really good that they're starting to form partnerships between a group like SETI and PayPal. Even though I try to avoid PayPal as much as possible, they're not particularly kind to a lot of small businesses. But in theory, I think this is, this is sort of how things will be going. And I think this is, uh, this is a good start. Yeah, so. I mean, you know, I mean, they can. Everybody does what they can, and if you're Elon Musk and you're building uh, super awesome space rockets, then that's what you do. And if you're Bigelow and you're making space hotels, and if you're PayPal, then you figure out how people will pay for their space rockets and space hotels and return flights from space. If they so. partner with Bitcoin, then it'd be all over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can't have that. Um, so some small businesses are taking Bitcoin as a way to sort of differentiate yeah, themselves yeah. from the crowd. But I, let's not get into Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So I, I, I just think, you know, I mean, why not? Like, I'm not going to stop them from having this conversation and working out the infrastructure. I suspect there's not going to be a lot that will get done until we have the, you know, the rockets and the hotels and the things that people want to buy in space. So, um Okay, cool. So the I guess the last conversation, this is something you worked on, David, was uh, just a call for amateurs to help search for lunar impacts? Yeah, and it's interesting that actually we're entering into that phase of the moon right now where the toward last quarter phase where uh, what they're doing is they're actually doing video, high-speed video aimed at the moon, and NASA's been doing this for some time and looking for meteor shower impacts on the moon. And this kind of tied in with the, the Lunar Dust Explorer that's going up Laddie in September 5th. It's launching out of NASA Wallops. And it's going to be a pretty spectacular night launch, by the way. A lot of the East Coast will see it. But it's the American Lunar Planetary Association has a call out there for amateurs that have these, these high-speed these high speed video rigs to possibly try to video and look for impacts on the moon. Uh, trying to characterize things like the parasites are coming up in August, uh, the torrids are peaking right now, looking at, and there was an impact earlier this year in March that was a, a big high profile impact that NASA had caught, I think March 15th or so. And incidentally, if you don't have a high speed rig that is uh, kind of geared toward doing this sort of thing, the International Meteor Association is always looking for people to do meteor counts because whatever is hitting on that dark side of the moon is generally streams that the Earth is entering into as well. And those kind of counts don't take anything but just going out and noting how many meteors you see and doing a report. I've done those sorts of things. I'm usually doing on any of the larger showers like the Leonids or the Parasites. I'm out there. Just uh, The Eta Aquarius is another one coming up. I'm just out there counting uh, per hour. 10 meters per hour is about my level of interest. If it's weaker than that, I usually pack it in and do something else. But if a meteor shower like the Geminids last year was a pretty active shower and I was in a dark sky location out in North Carolina, so I stayed out there most of the night watching those. So those are ways that amateurs can contribute to an upcoming mission. Uh, and there was there was a video just a couple of months back, right, where someone actually captured a, you know, a little puff of fl that was flash the of one, light. Yeah, that was the one in March. That was yeah. the one that NASA caught. We wrote about that, that yeah. there, was a, there was an impact. These, like I said, are on the dark side of the moon, which is different than a lot of people kind of confuse the, the far side and the dark side. When we're seeing the moon toward crescent and first quarter phase, we're seeing that unlit dark time, nighttime side of the moon. The moon is in in, uh, in tidal locks, so one day there is equal to one synodic period, which is like 29.5 days. But that dark side of the moon is where you're going to see these impacts. Now, these micrometeoroid impacts, they're very fast and very faint, and they're getting glared out by that brighter crescent phase of the moon. So they're going to show up on video impact. It would have to be a big impact for you to see visually. Those kind of impacts don't happen often. And there's actually a program called Lunar Scan that's in association with that one project that will actually take and scan through video frames looking for high-speed impacts. It will do it automatically. It was a NASA engineer that designed this. And I've used Lunar Scan before. I did a whole video uh, sequence while I was imaging the total lunar eclipse in 2010 in December 21st. 
and I used the lunar scan because the Geminids and the Ursid meteors were active at that time. There's some discussion of whether during that total lunar eclipse we were going to see impact flashes. It's worth a try. I didn't see anything, but I, I used lunar scan to comb through all my video just to see if I hadn't caught anything of interest. Or it would be cool to catch, and it's not out of the question, during a dark lunar eclipse to catch an impact during the eclipse would be kind of cool. I don't know if that's been done yet. I don't know. You, it could be you. Yeah. You it's always worth watching for these kind of things. Okay, well, I think we're reaching the sort of end of our time, and uh, we're all out of stories, so uh, I'm going to say goodbye and thank people for participating, So, and also find out where we can f learn more. So, Sandy, where can people find more Sandy? I am on Twitter, at S-O-N-D-Y. You must have started pretty early. Yes and you no. You short handle. Um, I, my, I, I've been on Twitter since I think spring 2006, but not with that handle. Um, I know someone at Twitter, and uh, she, she gave me that. Oh, so okay. that was very kind of her in the last couple of months, actually. I started up right at the beginning, but didn't think to get Fraser. I probably could have gotten at Fraser if I'd, you know, if I'd <laughs> even if it even occurred to me. But I got F. Kane. Live and learn. I know. I do. I do have Sandy.com, and I have I've had that since. 92,000? Oh, okay. 99? That's pretty good, too. Oh, uh, that would have gone. But yeah, so, and you are, um, you know... I'm at Arecibo Observatory. There are a lot of very <clears throat> incoherent posts about asteroids right now because our observing schedule really makes no sense. We've been, I think, Wednesday night, we were up from 10 p.m. until 7 a.m. This morning we were observing from 3 a.m. until 7 a.m. And then tomorrow we're on from 8.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. So if you want to watch the slow descent into madness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, th I thought radio astronomers get to, you know, they get to observe during the day like a regular yeah, human being. to observe being. during the day. It's really strange to be in the control room when it's light out. But that doesn't mean that the asteroids are necessarily up in the middle of the day. Sometimes they're up at night. Right. You guys don't get clouded out. That's kind of cool. We do not get clouded out, but occasionally when there's a lightning storm that rolls in, the tie-downs for the telescope um, have to be turned off because wow. if lightning strikes the motors, it'll break them. Oh, so we, so do, we do have other problems. <laughs> right. But we can observe. Radar's like the honey badger. It simply doesn't care. We observe let the during mercy the day. Of we observe during the rain. If you, yeah. uh, I wrote a blog post recently for the Planetary Society about how radar Actually, doesn't care. the engineering side doesn't care and how it works. So if you want to read that, there's a Honey Badger reference. There. there we go. Um, Amy, share your title. Um, I am AST Vintage Space on Twitter, and my blog is also called Vintage Space. You can Google it because my name can be hard to spell. Um, I'm also at Discovery News, Al Jazeera English, Motherboard, Device, Scientific American, and I think that's it, and the Google Pluses and Facebook. I have all space history all the time. I have, I have described you as the hardest working uh, uh, woman in uh, space you're journalism. Too kind. Yeah. <laughs> also the biggest space nerd. So just you know, as long as you know, I'm also yeah. unkind. Unfortunately, all of my models are not places you can see them from my computer anymore. If you could so... get those set up, that would really contribute <laughs> to the sort of background. I'll do what I can, Fraser. All right, <laughs> David Dixon. Where do we find more of your writing? I am at Astro Guys with. I am at AstroGuys with a Z across all platforms, and when it's cloudy out, you can find me writing at Universe Today, my own site, AstroGuys.com, writing cur curriculum, science curriculum for Schmoop, uh, Listasaur, and wherever else I might pop up. Those are my primary sites. Fantastic. And, uh, and also, you join us regularly on the Virtual Star Party, which yes, is Yes, I am in the Virtual Star Party. <laughs> um... Hugo Burnham just posted something funny on the event page, but I'm not going to say it on the show. Um, uh, yeah, and so and as you as I mentioned, I am the publisher of Universe Today. I don't write so much on Universe Today anymore, but I still publish it. I'm still pulling the strings. Um, but uh, but I have been doing a lot of uh, sort of video stuff on YouTube, which is kind of fun. And, uh, and they're so, really good too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah they're really cool. good. They're pretty cool. I try. To figure this stuff out. So uh, if you want to watch those, they're sort of they're the ones with the little pictures in my YouTube stream, and uh, so you can subscribe wherever the subscribe button is. 
And if you have a suggestion for a topic you want me to cover, I'd be glad to do that. Um, yeah. So And so the next thing we're going to do is going to be the virtual star party on Sunday night. I'm not going to be there, so it's going to be the Scott. Scott's going to be running the show with the astronomers. Um, I'm going to be at a wedding. so I will bring Saturn weather willing. <laughs> nice. Nice. Now is the, now is the time for Saturn. That's, that's the big if. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for the uh, team for joining us this week. I really appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye.